Well, here we are, the penultimate episode and the final stretch of Halo 5's level discussion. Let's get to it. So, Osiris has hijacked a Guardian to follow Blue Team to parts unknown. Those parts are, as we know, the forerunner world of Genesis. The 13th level of Halo 5 opens on a fairly positive note with Osiris running down the back of a Guardian as it tries to shake them off. It's an unfortunately brief but absolutely awesome set piece to open the level. As the Spartans arrive on Genesis's surface, they finally make contact with Blue Team. Before they can talk too long, however, Cortana interrupts, audibly surprised at Osiris's presence on the Forerunner world. Then she just fucks off. Weird. It isn't long before Osiris encounters another AI, the breakout character of Halo 5, 031 Exuberant Witness. Seriously, she's a fantastic character in one of the few things in Halo 5 I don't think I've seen any real criticism of. Much like 343 Guilty Spark before her, Exuberant provides useful exposition and is quite eccentric. Also like Guilty Spark, she does not approve of Cortana. A construct in the car? That is absolutely unacceptable. Thankfully, she doesn't want your head. Save his head. Dispose of the rest. Anyway, the Genesis level, like many of these last levels, isn't all too heavy on plot development. Basically, the level has Osiris going from set piece to set piece, occasionally stopping and defending as Exuberant hacks a door or bridge. I will say, gameplay wise, this is one of my favorite levels. The opening run down the Guardian's back, the always fun tank run, and even though it's kind of tired at this point, I even enjoy the Warden fight at the very end. Of course, this is largely because you can use the Answer, which is probably one of the most fun guns in the game. Story-wise, as I said, there's not a whole lot going on. Over the course of the level, Exuberant talks about what the Domain is, what the Guardians are, and reiterates the real purpose of the Mantle. A forced peace upon the galaxy. The threat of death overpowering any celebration of life. Yeah, I'm sure your version will be different, Cortana. The most interesting detail revealed comes towards the end when Exuberant notes that the Warden isn't a robot, almost hinting that it could be a composed essence, or at least not a normal Ancilla. Sadly, this goes unaddressed throughout the rest of the game, not even in the intel. She also reveals that Blue Team has been kept wandering around the gateway since arriving for reasons unknown. In the game, Exuberant says they'd been wandering for hours, but if we pay attention to the dates in the game, Blue Team has been on Genesis for two days at this point. What exactly have they been up to the whole time? What has Cortana been saying to them? It also makes me wonder, if Exuberant really wanted to stop Cortana, why didn't she try to contact Blue Team before they entered the gateway? She notes that her administrative privileges have been largely revoked, but what was physically stopping her from making contact with Blue Team face to face? Moving forward, Osiris finally catches up to Blue Team, asserting that they are there to help. Before anything can be done, unfortunately, Blue Team is teleported away somewhere closer to Cortana. Where exactly is never made clear. Before Blue Team can wander too far, they are again confronted by the Warden, who is intent on blocking their passage. Cortana, however, insists he let them pass. She insists hard. Unfortunately, she can't seem to stop the waves of Prometheans that oppose Blue Team. It seems. As the level goes on, we get what I have come to think of as a great moment of character development for John, especially in a game devoid of it. Psychological tactics. Saying my name. Playing nice. What would you have me do? Tell me the truth. How many people died when you called the Guardians here? Excuse me? You know, don't you? The exact body count. Seriously, listen to John's voice during this moment. At this point, he's been dealing with the fact that Cortana is an enemy, the constant berating of the Warden Eternal. He's worn down, and props to Steve Downs for really making that come across. If only the script would let him do it more often. Further, immediately after this, Kelly proposes that Cortana is letting all this happen, that she could reign in the Warden whenever she wants. And again, this is coming from Kelly. She's the one who, until now, has been trying to defend Cortana for the Chief's sake. The rest of the team agrees, but when Fred asks how they can hope to stop Cortana, the chief, despite everything, still believes he can save her. I really wish this had been far more prevalent throughout the campaign, as this is the sort of development we were promised. Sort of. I'm sure some lack of development is due to Blue Team's lack of levels, but that's not really an excuse. Anyway, after more waves of Prometheans, Blue Team confronts three Wardens before finally reaching... Uh, um... I really don't know what this room is, actually. 
In fact, I have no idea where any of this level is set. Where the hell have we been this whole time? We're not in the domain, that's for sure, but if you look around the level, it does not look like Genesis. However, when we pick up again as Osiris, Cortana, and Blue Team are definitely still on Genesis. But, getting back to the story, Blue Team is confronted by an army of Wardens, but are luckily saved by Cortana, who seems to banish all the Wardens at once. Wait, what? Yeah, Cortana can suddenly banish the Warden, no problem. How? Well, we have two possibilities. First, it could be that the closer the Warden was to whatever this location is, the more power Cortana had. The second, as suggested by Kelly earlier, is that Cortana could reign in the Warden at any time. The second option actually works really well with the Chief's comment earlier about psychological tactics. Imagine it, you're fighting through waves of enemies confronted by impossible odds, saved at the last moment by your once thought dead friend. Tell me that's not the ultimate, if not somewhat cliched, psychological play. So, after ridding the room of Wardens, Cortana, now wearing armor, a visual indication of her change, confronts Blue Team and the Chief. Also note, her armor has an Eld, the symbol of the Mantle of Responsibility. And boy, what a scene. This is everything that we have been building up to for the whole game, and to me, it was a decent payoff. So, Cortana confronts Blue Team, the Master Chief, happy to see her old companion reunited with his family. They are not so happy, and in fact, when Cortana first approaches, we get this interesting little bit where Linda steps forward, protective of the Chief. Cortana again tries to explain her plan, saying she wants to make people better than they are. John draws an instant connection between this and the Spartan 2 program, which Cortana denies. Now, this bit is interesting because, at first glance, it goes against what we know of John. In Fall of Reach, it notes that while he is aware of the horrors that were done to him and the Spartans, he is actually thankful for it. He would never want to live a normal life. Now, decades later, John is questioning what was done to him, and while I doubt that he would ever have wished his life forced on others, his tone does not, to me at least, seem to match the boy that was once thankful for his lot in life. This is John questioning everything that was done to him, questioning his life, likely as a result of what happened in Halo 4. But anyway, John tries one more time to talk Cortana down, but there's no turning back. Stop. No, John. This is too important to stop. To protect John and Blue Team from what is to come, and partially to keep them from interfering with her plans, Cortana steals Blue Team in a cryptum, where they'll sleep for 10,000 years. Now, let's talk about Cortana's motivations in Halo 5. I brought it up last time when Halsey seemingly laid them out in plain English. You know what I did to create the Spartans, all in the name of the greater good. Cortana is built from a matrix of my own mind. The domain gives her incredible power. But noted that I disagree that it's so simple. Sure, Cortana may justify her actions by claiming the greater good, but that's not necessarily a motivation. It can be, but I don't think it's Cortana's. No, I think her motivations are something deeper, something much more personal, a goal she's had since she first met John just prior to the Fall of Reach. Allow me to read an excerpt from Halo The Fall of Reach. Whatever the Master Chief had been through in the past, it was done. He was in Cortana's care now. She would do everything in her power, short of compromising their mission, to make sure nothing ever happened to him again. Here, I believe we can see Cortana's true motivations. She wants to protect the Master Chief. This has been her goal since discovering what Dr. Halsey had put him through, and whether you believe the Cortana in Halo 5 is the true Cortana or a rampant personality, the motivation fits. If there is no war, there would be no need for warriors, and John would never be at risk again. With Blue Team locked away, it's now up to Osiris to save them and stop Cortana. Exuberant Witness explains the situation before leading Osiris to the Cryptum's location. As before, there's not a whole lot of story material really going on here. It's mainly a bunch of set pieces, not that that's necessarily an issue. As Osiris heads towards the Cryptum, Cortana begins the process of distributing the Guardians. Locke asks where they're going, to which Cortana responds to bring peace. When Locke points out that her peace is more a threat of death, Cortana compares it to the threat of death that she and other AI have lived under since day one. This, and the brief conversation that continues, brings up an interesting point. AI are largely treated as objects in the Halo universe. For the average fan, it can be something of a revelation. In the game, AIs are treated as almost human, especially when it comes to the relationship between John and Cortana. Sergeant Johnson seems to have a very human-like respect for Cortana. 
and even Serena in Halo Wars is treated kind of like a civilian consultant rather than a piece of technology. It's an interesting change of pace for the games, if nothing else. So, as Osiris arrives near the location of the Cryptum and begins their fight through waves and waves of Covenant and Prometheans, Cortana starts her series of taunts to try and get them to give up. She starts by broadcasting dozens, if not hundreds or thousands, of AI, including former Governor Sloan, pledging their allegiance to Cortana. As the level goes on, Cortana gets into more personal information, questioning their motivations and abilities. Now, this part in particular has gotten a lot of flack. The common criticism, as far as I've seen, is that Cortana comes off as something of a Bond villain. Personally, I disagree. I thought it was a nice way to bring up the past of each character and to flesh them out a bit. It also works with her habit of using psychological tactics. For Blue Team, it was warmth and compassion. For Osiris, it's digging up the dirt on their past, noting their shortcomings. If anything angered me, it was Cortana's overall dismissal of Osiris as a threat. Never once does it feel like she takes Osiris as a serious threat. I mean, with everything at her disposal, she can't find a way to present a real challenge to Osiris. Part of the problem is the game's design itself, but the other problem is that the Warden is the ultimate boss of Halo 5, and we fought him in the fifth level, never mind the repeat battles ever since. There's nothing more challenging to throw our way. That said, the final level is actually quite a bit of fun to play, especially the section where you're destroying the cores in order to get to the Cryptum. Once the cores are destroyed, Osiris and Exuberant move to recover Blue Team, but their Cryptum is pulled away. The only way to get to it now is for Exuberant to try and gain access to a passageway that leads to a relay that will allow Exuberant access to Genesis again. As she begins her task, Osiris defends against more waves of Prometheans, occasionally lending a hand to Exuberant's efforts. Towards the end, Cortana makes a galaxy-wide transmission addressing every known species short of the Yan Maya. Guess that's just another technical oversight, right? In all seriousness though, the moment was pretty cool in my opinion, especially with Cortana quoting the didact almost word for word at some points. Our strength shall serve as a luminous sun, toward which all intelligence may blossom, and the impervious shelter beneath which you will prosper. Our strength is a luminous sun, towards which all intelligence blossoms and the impervious shelter beneath which it has prospered. If I had one complaint, I wish 343 had taken the opportunity to introduce some other species. Not all that long ago, 343 confirmed that the Sharkui, a creature cut from first Halo CE and then Halo 2, is still considered canon to some degree. How awesome would it have been to hear it and other new species directly addressed? As I keep saying, missed opportunities 343. So, after a few more battles, Exuberant unlocks the passageway at the center of the room. Osiris makes a mad dash for the relay, all the while being hit by energy waves from Cortana's guardian. Interestingly, during this sequence, Cortana asks where Infinity is, noting that she can't locate it. To me, this was extremely odd, and during my first playthrough actually kind of took me out of the moment. Why can't Cortana locate Infinity? Of all UNSC ships, I'd imagine that's the one she'd have the easiest time finding because of the Forerunner engines. We've seen Forerunner tech easily mess with them before, so why now, with the domain granting Cortana access to tons, if not all Forerunner tech, is she unable to locate it? It makes no sense, especially if you've read the Forerunner saga. In it, the Didact talks about how Forerunner ships can, rather easily, be tracked unless they make illogical jump patterns. Unless Infinity is doing a super cold protocol at the moment, I can't imagine that there's any good reason Cortana can't locate the ship. Anyway, despite the energy waves, Osiris finally makes it and destroys the relay, granting exuberant access to Genesis. And God, do I love this moment. Do you hear me? I have control again! It's an absolutely brilliant sequence, and for all of Halo 5's narrative shortcomings, a nice way to end the level and the game. Osiris succeeds in rescuing Blue Team, but fails to stop Cortana. As Osiris reveals this to Blue Team, Infinity is seen over what we can presume to be Earth, receiving dozens if not hundreds of distress calls from ships and colonies across UNSC space. Just as a Guardian, I presume the one that was originally holding Blue Team's Cryptum, arrives. Cortana appears on Infinity, the Guardian readying an EMP. With few other options, Lasky orders a random slipspace jump, just as the Guardian fires the EMP, taking out all electronics on the planet and in surrounding space. In slipspace, Lasky orders random jumps until he can find a way to fight. Now, I've heard a lot of flack over this action, and I can't say I agree with it in the least. 
Lasky was up against a forerunner machine that, to his knowledge, had decimated entire colonies and whose weaponry was unknown to him. He had no idea what kind of effect the EMP would have on Infinity, and hell, had he tried to fire on that round, there's no guarantee that it would have done sufficient damage, let alone hit. Guardians are a bunch of floating parts that can move around. Basically, the only way to make sure humanity even had a chance to fight Cortana was to run. Live to fight another day. Anyway, the game comes to an end with Chief and Locke arriving on San Helios, presumably with their respective teams off-screen, and Halsey saying, It took you long enough. Of course, if you play on Legendary, you also get one extra cutscene. A Halo ring lighting up, Cortana humming the same tune that we hear in the very first cutscene of Halo 5. And that concludes the story of Halo 5 Guardians. Overall, I find the game very enjoyable even now, and in terms of raw gameplay and level design, Halo 5 is one of my favorites. However, as I said at the very start of all this, the narrative is all over the place and a major step down in terms of quality from Halo 4. Is it the worst story in Halo? I'd hesitate to say yes, but even if it were, I wouldn't exactly call that an insult considering the other stories in Halo titles. But more on that in the wrap-up. For now, Easter eggs and intel. As is often the case, there's a ton of awesome content, even if not all or even very little of it has to do directly with the story. We'll start with the conclusion to Kit Pitlimp's story, and what a sad ending it is. If you are a god, I worship you. Otherwise, worship me. Wait, no, no! There's also a couple of interesting logs about the Covenant perspective on Genesis. While the Sanghelia, as I'm sure you've guessed, are fervent in their beliefs, the Ungoy, not so much. So I've been thinking, if this place is supposed to be all perfect and made for us, how come nothing looks right? Where's the salty box, huh? Where's the methane springs? I mean, we can't even breathe over here! Not even the elites like it. I mean, who was this paradise made for, huh? I got no clue. There are several entries dealing with UNSC forces that got dragged to Genesis, and an account by a Sung Healy talking respectfully of a grunt named Bib Jam. Though the log is presented in a very serious tone, I honestly find it kind of funny. The Sanghili reveres this Ungoy who talks about fighting as if there is no honor in death, but that's basically the default Ungoy mindset. One I found particularly interesting was from a Sanghili that directly mentions the servants of Abiding Truth. The hand of the Didact was broken. Why have none risen to take his place? Although I do find it a bit weird, it almost sounds like Joel had taken control of the servants, which then makes me wonder whatever happened to Avu Med Talkem. If he were alive, you'd think he'd take the chance to lead the abiding truth once Joel fell. It's an interesting mention, but one that's equally as confusing. Finally though, let's talk about what you've undoubtedly been waiting for, the mysterious forerunner and Bastion. When we last left him, he had uploaded his consciousness into the domain. Once inside, he instantly finds himself on Genesis. Why? Recall my theory about the domain's survival, that while damaged, it was still around, just inaccessible, save from a powerful hub like the one on Genesis. Like Cortana, this forerunner was instantly pulled to Genesis, the one place the domain still had some sort of interaction with normal space. The logs go on to mention the Organon gone, the domain burning, as if they were separate things rather than one and the same, though I could be misinterpreting that. The next entry skips forward a bit as he notices the Warden making a pact with someone, obviously Cortana, and being surprised that the Warden is active again. Too bad we still don't know a damn thing about him. The logs go on as Cortana discovers the Guardians, the Forerunner crying out for someone to stop her. Then it notes that Cortana has noticed our Forerunner in the system and tries to hunt him down. You've changed. Chief, you have no idea. Anyway, the story of our Forerunner comes to a close as the Warden and Cortana are distracted, likely by Osiris, and he notes that the Domain is healing. With clarity for the first time in unknown years, he seemingly finds Bastion. And while that concludes that story, it leaves a lot of questions, notably what the hell is Bastion? The context would imply that it's some kind of world or installation, perhaps this Forerunner's homeworld. Looking at the definition of a Bastion, it doesn't really help. 
a bastion can be a type of fortification or a place that upholds a certain value or condition. By the former definition, Bastion could be seen as a fortress world, which, funny enough, was used by Cortana in Halo CE to describe the ring world. The second definition would seem to make it sound like some kind of refuge, almost like a shield world. So really, we have no idea. Halo 5's intel can be fun to listen to and certainly fleshes out certain aspects of the universe, but as I noted a couple times now, it has little to do with Halo 5 itself. Setting up for the sequel slash future is nice, but please make sure that we understand the story being told first. So, I think now is a good stopping point. Next time we'll talk about the deeper connections Halo 5 has with Halo's pasts, some ideas for Halo 6 or whatever comes next, and a re-evaluation of my ranking for Halo 5. Until that time, I would encourage you to check out a certain blog run by a gentleman who goes by the handle of Harspis. He is currently doing an excellent, I mean absolutely excellent, level-by-level -level breakdown of Halo 5. His views differ from mine on a number of points, but I always love opposing views, and Harispus is truly a master wordsmith. Check out the link below to his blog, you won't regret it. Thanks for watching, and until next time, this has been Halo Canon. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you liked this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up, subscribing, and sharing it around. You are the reason I get to keep doing this, so thank you, profusely thank you. If you want to dive deeper into Halo's lore, head over to the Halo Archive. It's a lore-based community that welcomes everyone from experts to rookies. No matter what your working knowledge, you'll be sure to find a friend and a good time.